Dove Books on Tape presents Chaos by James Clake. The police in the small town of Los Alamos, New Mexico, worried briefly in 1974 about a man seen prowling in the dark night after night, the red glow of his cigarette floating along the back streets. He would pace for hours, heading nowhere in the starlight that hammers down through the thin air of the mesas. The police were not the only ones to wonder. At the National Laboratory, some physicists had learned that their newest colleague was experimenting with 26-hour days, which meant that his waking schedule would slowly roll in and out of phase with theirs. This bordered on strange, even for the theoretical division. In the three decades since J. Robert Oppenheimer chose this unworldly New Mexico landscape for the atomic bomb project, Los Alamos National Laboratory had spread across an expanse of desolate plateau bringing particle accelerators and gas lasers and chemical plants, thousands of scientists and administrators and technicians, as well as one of the world's greatest concentrations of supercomputers. Some of the older scientists remembered the wooden buildings rising hastily out of the rim rock in the 1940s, but to most of the Los Alamos staff, young men and women in college-style corduroys and work shirts, the first bomb makers were just ghosts. The laboratory's locus of purest thought was the theoretical division known as T-Division, just as computing was C-Division and weapons was X-Division. More than a hundred physicists and mathematicians worked in T-Division, well paid and free of academic pressures to teach and publish. The scientists had experience with brilliance and with eccentricity. They were hard to surprise. But Mitchell Fagenbaum was an unusual case. He had exactly one published article to his name, and he was working on nothing that seemed to have any particular promise. His hair was a, a ragged mane sweeping back from his wide brow in the style of busts of German composers. His eyes were sudden and passionate. When he spoke, always rapidly, he tended to drop articles and pronouns in a vaguely middle European way, even though he was a native of Brooklyn. When he worked, he worked obsessively. When he couldn't work, he... He walked and thought day or night, and night was best of all. The 24-hour day seemed too constraining. Nevertheless, his experiment in personal quasi-periodicity came to an end when he decided that he could no longer bear waking to the setting sun, as had to happen every few days. At the age of 29, he had already become an ad hoc consultant whom scientists would go to see about any especially intractable problem when they could find him. One evening... He arrived at work just as the director of the laboratory, Harold Agnew, was leaving. Agnew was a powerful figure, one of the original Oppenheimer apprentices. He'd flown over Hiroshima on an instrument plane that accompanied the Enola Gay, photographing the delivery of the laboratory's first product. I understand you're real smart, Agnew said to Feigenbaum. If you're smart, why don't you just solve laser fusion? To a physicist, creating laser fusion was a legitimate problem. Puzzling out the spin and color and flavor of small particles was a legitimate problem. Dating the origin of the universe was a legitimate problem. Understanding clouds was a problem for meteorologists. Like other physicists, Feigenbaum used an understated tough guy vocabulary to rate such problems. Such a thing is obvious, he might say, meaning that a result could be understood by any skilled physicist after appropriate contemplation and calculation. Not obvious, described work that commanded respect and Nobel Prizes. For the hardest problems, the problems that would not give way without long looks into the universe's bowels, physicists reserved words like deep. In 1974, though few of his colleagues knew it, Feigenbaum was working on a problem that was deep. Chaos. Where chaos begins, classical science stops. For as long as the world has had physicists inquiring into the laws of nature, it has suffered a special ignorance about disorder in the atmosphere, in the turbulent sea, in the fluctuations of wildlife populations, in the oscillations of the heart and the brain, the irregular side of nature, the discontinuous and erratic side, these have been puzzles to science. But in the 1970s, a few scientists in the United States and Europe began to find a way through disorder, they were mathematicians, physicists, biologists, chemists, all seeking connections between different kinds of irregularity. 
Physiologists found a surprising order in the chaos that develops in the human heart, the prime cause of sudden, unexplained death. Ecologists explored the rise and fall of gypsy moth populations. Economists dug out old stock price data and tried a new kind of analysis. The insights that emerged led directly into the natural world, the shapes of clouds, the paths of lightning, the microscopic intertwining of blood vessels, the galactic clustering of stars. When Mitchell Feigenbaum began thinking about chaos at Los Alamos, he was one of a handful of scattered scientists, mostly unknown to one another. A mathematician in Berkeley, California, had formed a small group dedicated to creating a new study of dynamical systems. A population biologist at Princeton University was about to publish an impassioned plea that all scientists should look at the surprisingly complex behavior lurking in some simple models. A geometer working for IBM was looking for a new word to describe a family of shapes, jagged, tangled, splintered, twisted, fractured, that he considered an organizing principle in nature. A French mathematical physicist had just made the disputation's claim that turbulence in fluids might have something to do with a bizarre, infinitely tangled abstraction that he called a strange attractor. A decade later, chaos has become a shorthand name for a fast-growing movement that is reshaping the fabric of the scientific establishment. Chaos conferences and chaos journals abound. At every major university and every major corporate research center, some theorists ally themselves first with chaos and only second with their nominal specialties. Chaos has created special techniques of using computers and special kinds of graphic images, pictures that capture a fantastic and delicate structure underlying complexity. The new science has spawned its own language, an elegant shop talk of fractals, bifurcations, intermittences, and periodicities, folded towel diffeomorphisms and smooth noodle maps. These are the new elements of motion, just as in traditional physics, quarks and gluons are the new elements of matter. To some physicists, chaos is a science of process rather than state, of becoming rather than being. Now that science is looking, chaos seems to be everywhere. A rising column of cigarette smoke breaks into wild swirls. A flag snaps back and forth in the wind. A dripping faucet goes from a steady pattern to a random one. Chaos appears in the behavior of cars clustering on an expressway. The behavior of oil flowing in underground pipes. No matter what the medium, the behavior obeys the same newly discovered laws. That that realization has begun to change the way business executives make decisions about insurance. The way astronomers look at the solar system the way political theorists talk about the stresses leading to armed conflict. Chaos breaks across the lines that separate scientific disciplines because it is a science of the global nature of systems. It has brought together thinkers from fields that had been widely separated. The first chaos theorists, the scientists who set the discipline in motion, shared certain sensibilities. They had an eye for pattern especially pattern that appeared on different scales at the same time. They had a taste for randomness and complexity, for jagged edges and sudden leaps. Believers in chaos speculate about determinism and free will, about evolution, about the nature of conscious intelligence. They feel that they are turning back a trend in science toward reductionism, the analysis of systems in terms of their constituent part, quarks, chromosomes or neurons, they believe that they are looking for the whole. The most passionate advocates of the new science go so far as to say that 20th century science will be remembered for just three things, relativity, quantum mechanics, and chaos. Chaos, they contend, has become the century's third great revolution in the physical sciences. Like the first two revolutions, Chaos cuts away at the tenets of Newton's physics. As one physicist put it, relativity eliminated the Newtonian illusion of absolute space and time. Quantum theory eliminated the Newtonian dream of a controllable measurement process. And chaos eliminates the Lablation fantasy of deterministic predictability.
of the three, the revolution in chaos applies to the universe we see and touch, to objects at human scale. Everyday experience and real pictures of the world have become legitimate targets for inquiry. There's long been a feeling, not always expressed openly, that theoretical physics has strayed far from human intuition about the world. Whether this will prove to be fruitful heresy or just plain heresy, no one knows. But some of those who thought physics might be working its way into a corner now look to chaos as a way out. <laughs>